schedule where we can, we can hang with you. And uh, today, we are so excited. Some of you uh, know uh, that a couple of months ago, I believe it was in January, uh, we partnered with a church in Springfield, Missouri, the community church. We, uh, they were on the last phases of building their children's wing. And, uh, and whenever uh, we, some of you said, man, we love that. We'd love to be able to, uh, to help them. And we, uh, we sent them some money. And today, you're actually going to be hearing from their pastor. He's one of my oldest and dearest friends. His name's Brian Jenkins. He's the senior pastor there. Now, let me tell you something about Brian, which was really cool. Um, some of you guys, I will, in college, believe this or not, I was not the intellectual that stands before you today, okay? I was, uh, I was the jock and, um, and just a guy that, you know, my, my answer to everything was either, uh, uh, was either to fight or to, uh, uh, or to somehow beat someone into, uh, into uh, giving their life to Jesus. And I got around all these guys and uh, of the, of the, you're going to be hearing from the smartest one of my friends today, all right? And uh, some of, uh, you're going you're gonna to be able to tell immediately. We called him crazy old Dr. Jenkins. We, uh, he's, he's in his doctor, uh, doctoral program. Uh, we used to mess with him. I said, all the kids later on when you're a senior citizen are going to go, there's crazy old Dr. Jenkins whose great learning has driven him mad. Uh, you know, so uh, today I want you to give a very warm coastal church welcome to a guy who's back in Alabama for a couple of days. Would you give it up for Brian Jenkins? Here, here should be on. We're on, we're on. There's a space for that iPad here. This is my iPad. It's just a notebook with an apple on it, so I'm just going to put that right there. Welcome to church planning. You'll do well. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you are all doing well this morning, this beautiful Gulf Coast morning. Man, we, we, I, I got up in um, your church has just been so kind to us and very nice hotel room. We got up and I looked out at the window this morning and I, this is the, fir- the first three words that came to my mind this morning were three words. I woke up, I looked out from my bed, I could see out the window, and the first three words that come into my mind were, sweet home Alabama. Those were the first three words. So uh, I introduced my son, Max, who was able to road trip with me this weekend to sweet home Alabama, and and we thoroughly enjoyed that. So it is wonderful to be with all of you this morning. Thank you so much for not getting up and leaving when you found out Chad wasn't speaking. Uh, Some of you are figuring out how to do that even now. Well, we can give online. I don't know why we're still here. Um, I am Brian Jenkins. I'm the lead pastor of the Community Church. It is a church plant in Springfield, Missouri. Springfield is distinctive for a number of reasons. Number one, it's about uh, it's got about 160,000 people. It's the third largest city in Missouri. It's uh, metro impact. In other words, the entire size of its metropolitan zone is about 350,000 people. Um, it is uh, one of the single most churched cities in America. When the founding fathers designed Springfield, they designed it to have a church every six blocks was their goal. That's what they wanted. It is also the sixth whitest city in America. I said whitest. Uh, we're up there with such luminaries as Banger, Maine, <laughs> and several places in Utah. So we're, that's where we've made a really diverse. But uh, we are right in the heart of downtown. Um, Downtown Springfield is sort of its cultural epicenter. It's tied, it's uh, pulled between the cultural uh, gravity fields of two university systems. Drury University, where Bob Barker went to school. Thank you for having your pets neutered or spayed. And, uh, and, and uh, Missouri State University, where John Goodman went to school and probably should have been neutered. Hey! That's called a play on words. It's a rhetorical device. I'll bring you up to speed on that later. Uh, Springfield's also the home of Kathleen Turner, Ryan Howard, Cole Hamels, and the last one, our favorite son, Brad Pitt, which is all very exciting, very exciting. <laughs> and they're like, and, but who are you? I mean, these people I've heard of. Um, so my wife, Kelly, and I, uh, we all went to school, CBC, Central Bible College. Central Bible College, uh, may she rest in peace. Um, with Chad and Timmy and, and a couple of other dear friends, JT, I'm sorry, Jennifer, they, okay, JT, we were all there together. Um, after they all and went on and got real jobs, I transitioned into seminary, 
uh, and stayed there for a few more years. And then my wife and I were part of a fairly established historic church out in the uh, suburbs of Tacoma, Washington, which is just south of Seattle. We spent about 10 years there. I was a discipleship pastor. I became the executive pastor. And through a series of events, God began to really speak to my heart. And for, for me to say that, you don't know me from Adam, but there's a few people in the room who do know that. And for me to say God spoke to my heart, it's a pretty big thing. Number one, my heart's pretty much just a cold, dark place. But, uh, you know, God can shine his lights even in the most soulless of creatures. And um, so we decided, we decided that we would go to Springfield, Missouri, and that we would begin to show people that Christianity, although it has a specific message, does not demand a specific person be a part of it. That faith is more than about agreeing as much as it is about communing. That the story, the broad, beautiful, sometimes ugly, sometimes unfortunate history of our spirituality, of our faith, has always been centered around, I know we don't agree on this, but you needed Jesus, I need Jesus, let's celebrate his feast together. And so we decided that we would go, and we began the church, we did what we called our beta launch, or beta testing, uh, in uh, September, October of 2012, where we, um, we basically just, every Sunday, it was like, well, we don't, just be prepared that whatever you liked this Sunday probably won't happen next Sunday. And every Sunday was different. And then in January of 2013, we did our full launch, our grand opening. Uh, and that's what we did. We, we call ourselves a startup. Uh, so we're in a very um, progressive, we're in a very, what some people may label a, a hipster part of town. It's very art-driven, very music-driven. But everybody there is independent. We have independent breweries. We have independent artists. We have independent bands. We have independent art galleries. It's very non-established. So we consider ourselves sort of an indie church. It's the same thing. Um, and so that's what we do. We enjoy it. Uh, we meet on Sunday evenings. We're the, we're the sleep-in church is what we like to call it. There's other things that we like to call it. But we have a good time. We're kind of in and out. But you all helped us finish up and begin the process of completing our children's area. And so I want to thank you very much for that. Um, it's, uh, it's a unique little place where we meet. We meet in an old bank. Um, it was a bank that had been built in the, during the Depression. The bank went bankrupt because it was, you know, the Depression. That's why they call it that. just want to make sure you understand that, sir. I'm just, you seem very smart. You have both glasses on your head and around your neck. So I know you want to pay attention. Um, and so then it became, and it just went through a series of things. So now we meet there in this big, huge vault. I remember we walk in and we're dreaming about it. And me, who's a complete idiot, I'm not, you know, he says he's smart, but I got like one, I'm like a broken clock. I'm only right twice a day, but I am perfect twice a day. You know, I mean, that's kind of it. And I walk in and I go, man, we could do kid stuff in the vault. And every mother in the room just like, you're the stupidest person that's ever Hey, you, welcome, to, welcome to the community church. We're going to lock your children in a vault. <laughs> so now they're in a hallway on the way to the bathroom. So that's where they're at now. But you all helped that hallway. But we sincerely appreciate it. We were able to do some fun stuff. The kids have a good time. So I want to say thank you from our, our, my family. Uh, I have three kids. I have a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old who's actually over in Coastal Kids right now. And then we have a 6-year-old. And um, they've been a part of our journey. My wife, Kelly has been a part of our journey, obviously, as well. She's a barista in downtown Springfield, and she's great. And uh, she actually had to work this weekend, so we all couldn't come together. But I just sincerely want to appreciate you, and, and thank you for helping us. Thank you for investing us. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing in people's lives in Springfield, Missouri. I think some of the greatest rewards spiritually are the ones you never get to cash in. Because that means, I mean, you didn't give to our church because you had a friend there. You didn't give to our church because you knew someone who might go there one day. You gave to our church because you said, that's something I believe in. And even if I never, I never receive any tangible benefit, any earthly reward on this, I'm still going to invest in it. And much like those hearers of faith in Hebrews, right? They walked the journey, but they never saw the promise. You all did that. And so I, I just want to say thank you for that. Um, let's go ahead and get started today. Uh, I'm talking a little bit today about boldly going, and here's why. Every epic story starts with a great line, right? Every epic story starts with a great line. Uh, I'm a big fan of reading. Um, they're called books. I, I know Chad has one or two, which is very exciting. Um, 
like, don't let Chad sell that goofy jock thing. He's not that much of a jock anymore. But really, um, <laughs> but I consider personally, there's two stories. I think the greatest American piece of literature ever written from an, like, like, a, that was written by an American for the American experience. It's the opening paragraph of Moby Dick. If you've never read it, go back and read it. It's an amazing paragraph. The rest of the book, eh. but that first paragraph, man, old Herman dialed it in, right? And what is it? Call me Ishmael. And it starts with this huge, amazing opening paragraph. Charles Dickens in A Tale of Two Cities. These were the best of times. These were the worst of times. This is the summer of our discontent. Amazing things. And then other great. Now, see, I, I am, I am a nerd. And I don't, I don't, I don't hate on that. I'm a nerd. I'm a geek. I'm, a go- I'm all of that kind of stuff. So when I think of how things start, I think of really powerful things. Like there's nothing that excites me more than the green Lucasfilm logo, the 20th Century Fox noise, and then a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And you know this is about to be the most amazing thing I've ever heard. And then bam, and it starts, right? Lord of the Rings, I can fe- the earth is changing. I can feel it in the water. It's amazing. But none of them. None of them even remotely compare to what I think may be the most landmark opening statement of any piece of science fiction, which is simple words, space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its ongoing mission to explore brave new worlds, to seek out new civilizations, and to boldly go where no one has gone before. So what I want to talk about this morning is boldly going. What does it mean to take that Gene Roddenberry's idea of what, of what a future utopia where we had solved the world's problems and we're now ready to branch out into the universe and begin to see how can we benefit other societies? How can we share the change that happened in the world? How can we do that? We have to, according to Roddenberry, boldly go. So I, I want to talk about this morning, I want to talk about in the, in the context of the uh, early church, the first church as it was developing, centering around a group of believers in a town called Antioch. And here's why. This is, I believe you have blanks that you can follow along with this morning. Um, so the first thing, sort of the big idea, the one thing I want you to walk away from today understanding is this, is that God has an ongoing mission for each of us. God has an ongoing mission for each of us. And if you walk away from here for anything today, there's two things you don't understand. Number one, you need to be back here at 5.30 tonight for the crawfish boil. So even if you don't hear anything I say, I hope you got that part down. Oh, and the other thing is you need to know it's much easier to watch things online. That was the other thing we want you to get. But the third thing is this. God has an ongoing mission for each of us. And that will require one thing. That will require some level, some understanding, some appreciation of boldness. Now, I got to tell you something right now because this is just weird for me. When I speak and when I teach at my church, I sit and I'm not used to cameras. So I just want to see if this guy's going to follow me, if I can go all the way over here. And I'm going to go over here. Oh man, I got to shave. That's the creepiest thing anywhere. Anyway, all right, sorry. So God has an ongoing mission for each of us. Now, the story is this there is a group of men in a church in a town called Antioch. Antioch is um, sort of up to the north. And, and what had happened is as Christianity began to spread, which it finally did, and it took an unfortunate, tragic murder of, of one of their early believers, a guy named Stephen, to get Christians to start to move out. And it began to spin out in roughly three zones. There's Antioch, which is sort of north in the northern part of the Middle East. There was Jerusalem, which we want to consider the hub. And Jerusalem sort of took upon itself to be the founding church. They said, you know what? We were here first. Our leader is the half, is the biological half brother of Jesus. We're in charge. And then a really bunch of nutcases went out to Alexandria and Egypt, and they're all the fun, cool ones, and they wrote Hebrews, and it's awesome. Okay? So the Antioch church, they were a little bit more of the, yeah, whatever kind of guys. And so they had this group of believers there, and they began to desire to send people out. And it was Antioch where, after Saul, who would later become Paul, was converted, he was sent to Antioch basically to grow up, basically to quit being such a radical nutcase and, well, a little bit of a terrorist, and go there and just kind of chill out. 
Yeah, okay, so anyway. So here's some things we're going to take from this story today that I want you to think about. I want you to consider. I want you to try it on, see if it fits for you. If it doesn't make sense, then I encourage you to find some version of the story that makes sense for you. But this is the way that I'm choosing to look at it this morning. First thing that we need to understand is this, is that boldness requires finding the right people. Boldness requires finding the right people. Now, I want you to listen to me for a second, because Chad shared with me a little bit about the story and the history of this church and the type of people who are beginning to find faith here. And what I don't want anyone to think is automatically go, oh, I'm not the right person. Just shut up and listen to me, okay? Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3 says, there now, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, people like Barnabas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manea, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and they sent them off. Now, what does this mean? Here's what you understand. It starts with a list of people. It says there were great luminaries of that region, spiritual, true spiritual leaders, true spiritual influencers, people like, he says, Barnabas. And Barnabas, we all know, Barnabas is the encourager, the son of encouragement. He's great. Simeon, who was called Niger, tying him back to earlier accounts of the gospel. And, and I mean, great leaders, right? Lucius of Cyrene and Manea. Now, that word Manea, it's a play on words. He's basically Herod's foster brother. Herod, the guy who was killing everyone else, this was his foster brother. These were men of great influence. They were men of great ability. They were men of great notoriety. These were the people that should have gone. To go forward, These, if you were doing it like on paper, like if you were doing a, a fantasy draft of planting a religion, right? I don't know why you would do that, but for the sake of context, a fantasy draft of planting a religion, these are the guys you'd want on your team. These are your first rounds, right? These are the guys that you fight about, and when the other guy picks it, you go, ah. Oh. oh, and Saul. And that, and that guy. And, and, and if you could imagine reading this and going through it and going, yeah, I heard of him. Yeah, I heard of him. Lucius of Cyrene, oh, he's great. I love his stuff. He's the best. Uh, Manea, Herod, bad choice of friends, but no, he's a really cool cat. Saul, you mean the murderer? You mean the terrorist? You mean the guy who hunted us down every single day, who drove our families into prison, who was responsible for the, facade, for, for, for the fiasco, for the monkey trial of one of our early leaders, Stephen, and saw him murdered and held the coats while he was stoned to death. And why do we know about holding the coats? It's this, the equivalent of what would have been the prosecuting attorney in their rituals and their ceremonies was the one who held the coats. So Saul would have been the prosecuting attorney, the guy that basically sent Stephen to the chair, if you will. And now he's on the list. What does this mean? I didn't say God finds the qualified people. I didn't say God finds the perfect fit people. I didn't say God finds the people that look great on paper. What I said is God finds the right people. And when you live a life on mission, you quit worrying about being a perfect person and you start considering, am I the right person? And when you focus on being the right person, then you become the perfect person to live your life. See, here's the deal. I can't tell you what to do or how to live. I'm not built to live your life. I can only worry about me. Right versus qualified is the idea I want you to think about. God picked you to live your life. That means there are people in your life now that are perfectly situated and perfectly formed for you to be the one to help them understand who Jesus is, what he can do for them, and, what he, and how much he loves them. So what you don't have to worry about is, oh, man, Pastor Chad, he's so smart, and he's so driven, and he's so friendly at restaurants. Let me tell you something. They are friendly at restaurants. All of these guys, my old friend, and I'm just, I want to vomit the whole time. I'm like, do you really? Why well, do you talk to people? like That was my thing. And they're like, how do you talk to people like that? I mean, you just go up and talk to somebody. Like, even if you don't know them? Oh, I mean, it's horrible. I am an introvert. I have already had enough of people this morning. I'm being serious. <laughs> There's part of me, I'm like, uh, sorry. Uh, you know, I'm just, I, I'm done. But here's the thing. You know, who's, you know who the perfect person to live my life is? Me. You know who the perfect person to live your life is? You. God said, I need that guy. Not you, I'm talking about this. I mean, but I need Saul. Sorry, glasses, you're with me all morning. You just got to know that. 
Just get ready for the ride, okay? But God said, no, 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 I don't need Lucius. I mean, Lucius is doing Lucius' thing. I don't need Simeon as much as Simeon was. I mean, Simeon of Niger, you know who he could potentially be, right? The guy who carried Jesus' cross. He's like, no, I mean, that's a pretty good resume, but you won't work for what's about to happen. Because none of these guys understood what was in the hopper, right? None of these guys understood something that I believe. Now, so you got to remember, I was raised in Arkansas. My parents are from South Arkansas and Louisiana border. None of those people understand what people who grew up in this part of the country understood. Look, it may be kind of gray and have a bunch of legs sticking out of it, but you get it enough time, we call that a gumbo, and it's going to taste good. <laughs> and they're looking at it, and it looks weird, but God's putting this stuff together, right? You put a couple of bones in there, you got yourself a stew. I mean, that's, that's the idea that's going on, and they're looking at it, and no one else can figure it out, but God says, you know who I really need? Man, you know who would work for this? I need Saul. Why? You, li- you read a little bit farther and you find out. Roman citizen, which means he now had free access to literally everywhere in the world. Jewish educated. You want to have the conversation about how Jesus fits into, fits into Judaism? We can have that conversation. Greek educated. Do you want to talk about how Gentiles, how you view your philosophy, how your Stoicism, how your Epicureanism, how the teachings of Plato are starting to help you understand the universe already? Friends on Mars Hill, let's have that conversation. A little bit of a nutcase. I'm going to do whatever it takes. Kind of mean and grumpy. That's okay. Because he needed Saul. There's a verse in Romans that talks about Jesus. It says, when, at the right time, Jesus came into the world. Well, let me tell you something. At the right time, you came into the world. It's the same theory. Now, we're saying you're like Jesus? Come on, don't be goofy, but you know what I'm saying. We've all come into this, and there is a mission for you, and that mission requires, if I'm going to be bold, i got to say, hey, guys, I got this. I'm the one. So when people said, you're going, where? I said, i got to go to Springfield because I think I'm, and I don't mean, this is an arrogance. This is boldness. I think I'm the one. I looked into the lives, I looked at how my life was built, the way I had been constructed, the way I had been built. And I decided this is what we have to do. So boldness requires finding the right people. And guess what? You've been found. You've been found. You are the right person for the job. And if no one's ever told you that, I'm going to tell you that again. You are the right person for the job. Okay? Also, now, here we go. Sometimes boldness means crossing some boundaries. Sometimes boldness needs crossing some boundaries to explore brave new worlds, right? Let's look at what happens a little bit later on in the story. Acts chapter 13, verses 44 through 48. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. It was obviously not Memorial Day weekend. Hey, hey, oh, that's a church joke. Never mind. Um, But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first to you. So what happened was, is there, there's Paul and Barnabas, and they're going to all the crowds, and all of a sudden the Jews, who have been the, the inheritors, right? They're the stewards of this great message of monotheism, of this divine God, who is, rather than being a part of creation, is transcendent of creation, and he has now reinvaded creation in an attempt to restore it. That's, that's the essence of this amazing message. And the Jews are like, yeah, that's our story. We got this. You're talking our stuff. But all of a sudden, the Jews start looking around, and they begin to see Gentiles in the crowd. And they see Saul and Barnabas shaking hands with Gentiles, touching Gentiles, talking to Gentiles, engaging in religious discussion with infidels. And they say, whoa, wait, what? Time out. We can't do this. You don't get to do that. And so Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. And and I love this. And since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, he's like, basically, you decided you didn't want to live forever, so um, we're turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth, which he's quoting You understand an Old Testament passage there. So from the beginning, the Jews were intended to be a light to the Gentiles anyway. So Paul basically said, you didn't want to do it. You don't want to live so ever. So you know what? We'll do it. 
And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many were appointed to eternal life, believed. What do I mean by this? Simply, Paul, Saul, and Barnabas, I'll say Paul and Saul interchangeably this morning, Paul and Barnabas said, I don't care, I don't get to decide who gets to hear about Jesus. That's not my call. He said the Gentiles, we'll find some Gentiles, Greeks, Romans, Asians, right? Tax collectors, harlots. Who, do you, who gets to hear about Jesus? Because the radical story of Christianity is not its message. And I want you to understand me. There had been Jewish leaders trying to get Judaism to come up to things like love your neighbor as yourself. They'd been trying to get them to come up to love God with everything that's inside of you. You know what the really radical nature of Christianity is? It's access. The game changer, the reason they killed Jesus was not because of what he was saying, but because of who he was saying it to. And Jesus said, at this point, whoever wants in, gets in. Now, I've studied a lot of theology, and I owe a lot of money for the theology I've studied. I'm going to save you a lot of money. I'm going to give you all a graduate course in the book of Romans. Are you ready? Whoever wants in, gets in. Congratulations, you're done. You are all now Roman scholars, okay? And the reason why we do what we do, the reason why Chad decided to come back here and do what he does is because everyone who wants in should have a right to get in. And I don't care how you eat, I don't care how you drink, I don't care how you vote, I don't care how you don't vote, I don't care if you listen to this band, that band. Jesus says, whosoever will. The radical nature of what we believe as a spirituality is not... You know, yes, God so loved the world, but it's whosoever will. Some of you are whosoever will. You are. I know enough about Chad and the the people he loves and the people he feels drawn to. And somebody sometime along the road, I'm willing to bet, in some of your lives, somebody said, you know, maybe this church isn't for you. So Chad said, well, what about a church for all those people? What about a church for the rest of us? Like, a, like an island of misfit toys. Right? Where's the dentist on our island of misfit toys? It's like a money ball kind of church, right? We will do whatever it takes to bring this truth. God made the world. We broke it. Jesus fixes it. Let's go tell people that. Okay? And what I love about that is when the Gentiles... You guys got to be with me. I'm not used to people agreeing with me. Okay? All right. That's really throwing me off. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing. Why? Because for the first time they realized there's a God that loves us. Because all the Gentile gods hate them. They said somebody loves us. They're like Sally Field, right? You love me. You really love me. And they were begging for it. And that's what it it means, crossing boundaries. That means there will be people next to you every Sunday that you're uncomfortable with. I'm, just, I'm telling you right now. You're going to walk in here on a Sunday and you're going to go, hey, me, hey, hey, coffee, hey, 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 check my kid, hey, hey, hey. What are they doing here? <laughs> and you know, you want to know what? When you get to heaven, there's going to be people going, oh, let me get my wings. Let me get my uh, single origin coffee because it's heaven. You know, <laughs> what is he doing here? And you know what they're talking about? You. Because we have to cross boundaries. We have to be where no one has gone before. And there are people in your heart right now that only you care about. No one else cares about them. Nobody else wants them. But you do. That's your boundary. Go get them. <laughs> go get them, chap. Go. Get. Go on. Whatever it takes. Go get them. Boldness requires finding the right people. Boldness means crossing boundaries. Boldness means everybody has a mission. Boldness means everybody has access. And sometimes... Forgive me, Chad, I'm only here for the day, so I get to say stuff like this. Boldness means breaking the rules. Acts chapter 15, verses 6 through 11, the apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. What matter? Oh, I don't know, Gentiles loving Jesus. And after they had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth, (laughs) such a bandwagon dude, Peter, that by my mouth, oh, I heard of him first. Peter's the original hipster, by the way. I totally heard of the Gentiles before any of you people did. Um, That only makes sense to like three of you, uh, which makes you a hipster, by the way. Um, That by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, 
bore witness to them by giving the Holy Spirit, just as he, he did to us, verse 9, and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their heart by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear, but I believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. What's the context? Well, they decided, okay, okay, we're, we're okay with Gentiles coming in, but here's the deal. All you adult Gentile males, you got to be circumcised. And the Gentile males were like, the last part? <laughs> like as a dude, like as a grown man, you want what now? And Paul, literally the first fa- face palm in all of the Bible, right? Oh my God, you talked about that? Like, could you imagine this, the meeting afterwards? So what'd you tell the Gentiles? Well, we said, great, great to have you. We're excited about your future. We're excited about what's going to happen. One little thing, circumcision. Ah, uh, what? And I love what Peter says. We hate it too. He says it right there. Neither our forefathers nor we have been able to bear. Like we hate it and now you want them to? Just so they can quote unquote be clean now? Peter says, we already made him clean. Remember the dream, the sheet? I had to eat all that weird stuff at Cornelius' house. What did I do that for? Peter finally stepped up and said, I don't care, but no one has a right. If Jesus Christ himself had said that is clean, we never get to say it's unclean again. A person, an activity, a thing, whatever. And Jesus is the one that says, look, I don't care. Eat the lizard, eat the catfish, you know, whatever. Whatever you want to eat, eat it, because that's not what this is about. Paul would later go on to say that the church of Jesus Christ is not a matter of eating of drinking, but about the inward work that God does in the heart of man. So sometimes we've got to break our little rules, right? Sometimes I, no matter what it is, and look, I'm not going to get specific this morning, and I'm not going to tell you what to believe or what you should do. What I am going to say is this. In all of our lives, sometimes we have to look at something and say, do I need to get rid of this in order to help the people in my life have more access to Jesus? Because that's what he said. Could you imagine the first time Peter, Peter said, nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. And God said, get down there and eat the catfish. What would that have done to him spiritually? What if he was wrong? What do you think it did to Jesus the first time he went and shook hands with a tax collector or a prostitute? The first time Jesus, who'd been raised as almost the perfect rabbi, said, I'm going to put my hands on this leper now. What do you think it did to Paul emotionally? What it did to him spiritually when he went in and he thought about all that he had done to stop this sort of thing. And now he's saying, so you guys want to, I don't know, where'd you get that meat from? Oh, it's great. What happens here in our town is they sacrifice all the meat to the gods over at the pagan temple, but they give it to us for free because we're hungry. And Paul's, Paul's going, oh, yeah. And you eat it? You don't like keep burning it? Like, what do you do? And they're like, yeah, would you like some? And something inside of him said, this is not what Jesus is about. This is not what Jesus is about. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There are things in your life, whatever it is, and I don't get to tell you that, but I can tell on the looks in some of your faces that it's already happening. And you're thinking, what do I need to do? Because the best way to redeem people is to sacrifice sacred cows. That's what has to happen. Now, I'm saying this. Look, you're saying, woo, we get to do whatever we want. Don't be an idiot. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just asking you, are there people in your life that are, you? if you were willing, listen to me, listen to my heart, even if you're not listening to my words, if you're willing to be a little less uptight, a little less bound to something that has nothing to do with Jesus but has everything to do with your spiritual comfort, if you were willing to let it go, would someone be closer to Jesus because of it? That's my only question for you this morning. The other thing is this. Boldness means putting the mission first. Boldness means putting the mission first. Acts 15, chapters, uh, chapter 15, verses 13 through 21. After they finished speaking, James, James the half-brother of Jesus, replied, listen to me. <laughs> I just love it like a coach. All right, listen up. Simeon has first related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them from a people for his name. I'm going to skip a few verses. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to uh, to, to at them. And this is what we want. Abstain from things polluted by idols, excuse me, from sexual immorality and what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has in every city those who proclaim him for he's read in Sabbath in every synagogue. What he says this is he says, guys, just don't be gross and we'll figure the rest out. 
Don't do your gross, creepy stuff, the strangling of food, and don't be weird with each other, and we'll figure this out. We have to clarify the mission. He made it, we broke it, Jesus fixes it. Anything beyond that, honestly, it's up for debate. So just keep it that way. In your own heart. Now, there are things that you love, that you're passionate about, about your faith. You're passionate about your spirituality. You're passionate about where you sit at church. It's all of those sort of things. I get it. No, you understand, I'm the parking lot attendant. Put the mission of God first. Put the mission of God, the mission that says, whosoever will. Put that first, and then let Jesus Jesus take care of the rest. He never asked us to worry about it. He just asked us to spread it, right? It's like peanut butter. I don't care what it's made of. I just know it tastes good when I spread it. That was a dumb analogy. I'm not going to use that next week. Hold on. That was stupid. So then, what do we need to do? Very quickly. It's like the Oscars up here. So then, very quickly, number one, embrace your role. One of the beautiful things about science fiction is that you always know who's going to die. And in Star Trek, it's anybody wearing what? A red shirt. You're dead. You're done. It's over. But embrace your role. What do I need to do? Who was I built to reach? And be okay with it. Some of you are jocks. Some of you are nerds. Some of you are those weird Pinterest people that spend way too much time trying to figure out how to make wicker to go around a cup. I don't understand it, but that's you. Work it. Work it, girl. Or dude, I'm okay. All right? Number two, my favorite line from Star Wars. What? Han Solo, they're getting ready to go through the, uh, the, inter- the, the asteroid belt. And Empire Strikes Back. C-3PO's barking about. Han Solo says, look at him, says, never tell me the odds. Just ignore the odds. Yes, odds are that person may never come to Jesus, but you get it, it's like a miracle. That's what makes it special, okay? Number three, lead, follower, get out of the way. I know it's not a sci-fi movie, but it's still from Tombstone, so it's eminently quotable. You better commence to shooting or get out of the way. So lead, do something amazing, follow, support something amazing, or just let those who are going to do it, do it. Quit being a pain. And then number four, lock the door behind you. At some point in every sci-fi movie, somebody's got to quit the radiation from venting into the atmosphere. So somebody goes in and they commit. They lock the door behind them. You got to commit. You got to say, this is who God made me to be. This is what I intend to be. And this is what I will do. And we're going to do that together. When Caesar was coming back to declare himself emperor of Rome, he stopped at the line of the Rubicon River. And here's why. Because no one had ever brought a, an army, a standing army, into the boundaries of Rome before. And he said, if I do this, I can never go back. We have a saying, some of you have heard of it, maybe not, but it talks about crossing the Rubicon. It's a moment where you say, I am either all in or I can't do this anymore. Come on in. The, the water in the Rubicon, whew, it's just fine. But you got to find it. Faith should never be boring. If it's boring, you're doing it wrong. I'm telling you that right now. It's an adventure, friends. Last thought of the morning, it's an adventure. So I invite you to join the mission. I invite you to join the mission. Put away the boundaries. Break, a, break some rules now and then. Let Jerusalem worry about the problems Antioch creates. That, they'll do it anyway. They love doing that sort of stuff. As a church, just go out and c- keep creating problems for smarter people to solve. We just love Jesus, sorry, or whatever. And guys... It's been amazing. Thank you so much for letting me be with you this morning. I want to encourage you, if I have one word from one church plan or another, guys, you do you. Just you do you. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for investing in us. Thank you so much for treating my son like a king this weekend. It means a lot to me personally. I love some of the men and women of this church with more depth than you'll ever understand. So thanks for letting me come here today and party with you guys. God bless you. Live long and prosper.